I very much welcome um, Mr. State Secretary Flassbart. This is higher than I anticipated. <laughs> Jochen Flassbart, I very much welcome you to our uh, Think7 uh, Summit. We will now, um, in a minute, uh, turn towards the question, what is the so-called Zeitenwende that uh, Chancellor Scholz announced, and that in English would be um, the turning point in history, a turning point in history, referring to the Russian invasion um, in Ukraine on the 24th of February. What does this Zeitenwende, this turn in history, actually mean? Um, for the field of development cooperation, for our external policy fields. And State Secretary Flassbart um, is within, is the State Secretary within the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, as most of you know beforehand. Also for our international guests, he was the State Secretary within the Federal Ministry of Environment um, for eight years if I'm not mistaken, yeah, eight years. So he was very much together with Minister Schulz uh, um, shaping the climate um, politics and environmental politics of Germany for many, many years, and is now um, basically transferring. And also, if I may say so, taking some of the interests in the global public goods, including the battling of climate change, of biodiversity loss, into the sphere of um, international development cooperation and development policy making. Now, also for our, especially for our international guests, I would like to say a few words on the BMZ, the Development Ministry, and its position basically within the landscape of policy making within the German context. The uh, German Development Ministry is um, a ministry, um, well, it is part of our external policy fields, obviously, and it's as, as a core um, logic, I would say, regards solidarity and the investment into trans-regional trust building over, over um, long periods of time um, as, as core of its um, main uh, guiding logic. It understands itself um, well, or aligns its policy making to the Agenda 2030, and with this uh, consciously underlines that um, the policy making sphere within development policy does not focus on just one topic, for instance, poverty eradication, but puts the emphasis on to the interdependencies of a number of, um, of the uh, global challenges, and here um, emphasizes that it's about transformative structural policy making rather than basically choosing um, a, a type of policy making that could be confused with um, a charitable approach or with an approach that is fear-based in order to, um, to basically keep um, risks far from, from German and European borders. The ministry also, I think that's important, um, has, as, as this is um, good practice in democracy, so to say, uh, undergone a few changes in leadership over the years from basically the late 1990s onwards. It was in the hands of um, the Labour Party for many years under Minister Wittscherik Zoll, uh, then moved over to the Liberal Party under Minister Niebel and to the Conservative Party for the, for the last uh, eight years before Minister Schulze and State Secretary Flassbart came in. This is relevant because we saw quite a few shifts there in policy making and are um, now excited to hear how you embed the Zeitenwende into sort of also this, this perspective of earlier shifts and into the priority setting that uh, you are um, implementing now. Let me just say a few more words. Within, uh, in the years of basically from the late 1990s to early 2000s onwards under Minister Wittscherik Zoll, the, the conscious decision was taken to focus on the grand global challenges, on the global public goods, put this, these and the joint um, collaboration in order to tackle these into the center. Here, the official development assistance quote was still quite small. It was around 0.3% only. No? Um, the clear focus was placed on multilateral interaction and on the large cooperation with large transition economies as well as with fragile states. 
Then in the years after, we saw a bit of a shift. We saw an increase in the official development assistance quota, the ODA quota, to up to 0.5% under Minister Niebel. We saw a move um, by Minister Niebel moving the humanitarian aid as well as a focus on conflict um, prevention out of the development ministry and into the foreign ministry. And um, we saw a less or uh, reduced, reduced focus on the multilateral level. Under Minister Müller, we then saw a further increase of the official development assistance quota up to 0.7%, just above even during Corona times. We saw a regional focusing on Africa um, and we saw, um, which had a lot to do also with the migration crisis, and we saw, especially then in the later years, again, a shift towards focusing on structural policy making, also with regard to some of the discussions of shaping um, a value chain law. And now, under Minister Schulz and State Secretary Flassbart, we have um, we have a renewed priority setting. Um, you, you bring in, I think you will mention the, uh, the four core themes, but um, just to be brief, basically health has been put onto the agenda again as one of the core themes. We have already reflected on the fact that uh, just transition, feminist development policy um, and um, um, and, and health, including social security topics, have been um, brought uh, or have, have received a special focus. And I think Minister, uh, State Secretary um, Flassbad will now talk to us about what all of this means also under the considerations of the Zeitenwende. We are excited to have you here and the floor is yours, Mr. Flassbad. Yeah, dear uh, Anna Katarina um, Hornich, um, dear, dear colleagues, and, and if I may say so, friends, uh, uh, listen carefully to you, especially the last part, um, in the hope that I um, understand a little bit better my ministry. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks for. <laughs> Um, so, um, oh, it's getting up, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, just to uh, give an echo on, on what you said, yes, definitely, uh, we are back on the multilateral uh, level. In, uh, as you mentioned, Svenja Schulz and I, uh, coming from environment, uh, in environment, you are lost if you are not a multilateralist, and uh, that is what we want to strengthen. And I will come later um, in a minute back to that, uh, especially in, in times uh, where the charity approach, um, just doing everything by money. I mean, money is important, and uh, but uh, we need to have more intelligence. We need to um, have more of the view on the structural changes that allow us uh, to move the world uh, towards the better. So um, thanks for having me here uh, at the end of um, two days um, discussion uh, at the Think um, Seven Summit, uh, and uh, I, I um, saw into the program. I had a look into the program um, of uh, course, and I really want to congratulate uh, you. Um, that is really impressive what you discussed, uh, and uh, I, I also followed a little bit on social media. So I, I was not uh, uh, online. I didn't follow it uh, inclusively, but uh, I got a glance what had been discussed. And, and again, congratulations. You touched basically uh, on on all the um, issue of um, highest relevance for. Um, our ministry, uh, and thus I, I'm very happy that I also saw that uh, so in so many sessions, colleagues from uh, BMZ actively uh, participated in, in, in the different uh, fora and, uh, and sessions. Um, yeah, the summit started uh, with an input uh, by my uh, dear colleague Wolfgang uh, Schmidt, uh, head of the Chancellery, and he started of course, uh, with the uh, um, Russian uh, war and uh, uh, against Ukraine uh, and what it means for uh, also for the G7 presidency Germany uh, for our track uh, and also for uh, Elmau. Uh, I, I um, well, uh, saw also that he highlighted uh, the relevance, for example, of uh, solving 
um, not only the food crisis, I will come back uh, to that uh, in, a, in a, mid, a minute as a follow um, up of uh, or a consequence of, uh, of the war in Ukraine, but also didn't forget to mention that, of course, all the other crises remain, uh, such as the climate uh, crisis. Um, so, with what he started in, uh, I will basically end now uh, and coming back uh, to, to um, uh, this starting uh, point when I'm um, follow your request to discuss or uh, talk a bit about the um, international cooperation as part of the Zeitenwende, what you already um, uh, translated into, into English. Um, well, I'm very happy to share um, some thoughts uh, with you, but please don't expect uh, that I can give you full-fledged answers or concepts uh, what it means for Zeitenwende. It's a brand new discussion. Uh, and uh, so I also hope to get some input, and I saw it already in your recommendations uh, from uh, the uh, T7. I mean, what is appears clear to me is that also development policies uh, 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 needs to be fundamentally uh, assessed uh, against uh, the reality of Putin's uh, war. Uh, the 24th February, uh, I think you will have discussed it many times during the last two days, um, uh, marks a historic turning uh, point, um, comparable only um, like 9-11 um, or um, the 9th November 1989. Uh, the world is a different uh, one, not totally different, not everything is different, uh, but uh, the basic fundamentals we saw over the last decades uh, are destroyed uh, in, in a way. Um, uh, in Germany, this um, had uh, fundamental political consequences. Um, the, maybe in Germany more than in uh, other countries, and uh, the most obvious and prominent uh, one is uh, very obviously the revise, the revision of um, our positioning on uh, defense uh, and, uh, and military and security policy. I don't want to get into the details of, of that, but, but, but for the German society, it's a heavy debate and it's not over um, uh, yet. Also in uh, energy uh, policy, of course, we saw uh, tremendous uh, changes and uh, as uh, Christiane Lambrecht didn't expect that she wants, uh, would move her party and uh, her ministry into a new area of military po um, policy. Um, uh, my, my colleague and friend Robert Habeck didn't expect uh, that he would uh, uh, run around the globe and trying to get fossil uh, gas uh, to, um, uh, to replace uh, the gas from Russia as, uh, as soon as possible. So many things uh, have changed. And uh, of course, also um, development policy had, has to be adjusted. The immediate reaction, let me start with that, um, uh, was of course to help. Uh, in Ukraine. So um, we uh, reallocated uh, our budget uh, for Ukraine, with, which was and is, but it was also over the last decade, a very substantial um, uh, portfolio, basically investing uh, in progress in society, uh, in decentralization, good governance, and uh, although nobody should say that, uh, well, we are the source of energy for the Ukrainian people, I, I think it's a proof that these investments were not wrong. They were, they were right, uh, but of course they had to reallocate. And I don't want to get into um, the details of what we did together with uh, foreign office on uh, close to um, humanitarian aid, but also in structural, um, uh, in structural investments uh, to increase the ca capabilities of the uh, Ukrainian society to su survive in this, uh, in this uh, situation. Uh, the second one was a look into um, the well consequences outside the region, outside Ukraine and Eastern uh, Partnership, um, and what this means for uh, economic cooperation. And here again, uh, it became also in public quite soon um, visible um, the uh, food security issue uh, uh, was the emerging one and, and the very relevant one. Uh, for development cooperation. Because, of course, um, uh, fighting hunger is uh, in the genetics of a Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation. If you don't fix that, uh, we fail. Um, and it was an immediate look in, into this one. But also, um, 
not to allow the Russian narrative to survive um, in, in other regions of the world, such in uh, Africa, that as soon as there is a conflict in our neighborhood, our solid solidarity with others uh, in, the, in the world is immediately uh, uh, shrinking. And uh, therefore, this was another impulse also to discuss it, uh, to discuss in, in a special session with African ministers at our G7 development ministers uh, meeting uh, last, um, uh, last week. Um, the, the influence and, and the consequences for specifically the African uh, continent uh, uh, as a matter of, of the um, uh, of the war, and it, I mean, we, we have to spell it out again and again. Putin is not only uh, the aggressor against Ukraine; uh, he is uh, an aggressor against wide parts of this world, and even against those countries that still believe that he is a friend. Um, we reacted and um, quite on the spot um, and uh, will um, continue to react by um, providing additional um, help, financial support uh, for the food security uh, institutions uh, such as the World uh, Food Programme, others in the UN uh, system. Chancellor uh, Scholz announced uh, another 430 um, million euros at the um, extraordinary summit uh, meeting. And Svenja Schulz, I, I want to mention that one, I think it had been discussed in one of the sessions, also uh, proposed um, a, a global alliance for food security. It was, uh, it was first um, discussed at the spring meeting of the World Bank and uh, last week at the G7 development ministers meeting, we kicked off uh, the alliance. It's already on its way uh, to work uh, to be operational. Um, I, um, I discussed it with development ministers um, uh, in Brussels uh, at the EU development ministers meeting and specifically um, um, told our colleagues that this is an open-ended endeavor. It is not limited to the G7, everybody is invited. Uh, all countries, uh, institutions and um, civil society, uh, think tanks uh, and the private sector. It, it should work as an agile uh, platform to have the best available information right in time and to discuss the best way uh, to react on, on the um, uh, current uh, situation. Um, a part of that, without again going into details, it has to be very clear that um, all this is just to help in a very specific situation. It's not a sustainable solution at all. Um, so, of course, we need to look in, into the reasons why we could have uh, tapped in, in, into such a situation. Uh, I, I, I mean, you are expert, you are think seven, you, you might have known it. I didn't know that uh, uh, Egypt is dependent uh, on 80% of imports from uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Russia for, for corn and, and, and wheat or Lebanon, uh, 90%. And it's a disaster. I mean, what have we done during the last decades? And uh, just to share this a bit like an anecdote, I was approached at a, um, at, uh, at a meeting in Senegal at the water conference, UN water conference. Um, by, by the African Development Bank, and they are doing very good things now. Um, uh, and, and they wanted to get us on board for a specific approach by, by the AFDB, uh, and we are supporting them. But when I asked, well, do we have the seed? Yes. Do we have the farmers? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the know? It was always a yes. And my question is, why hadn't we done it during the last 20 years? It's, it's so obvious that this is a bottleneck and that we cannot accept that a continent in principle, not each and every region, not each and every country, but in principle, a continent like Africa being so privileged to produce uh, foods that it doesn't, didn't happen. So um, just a short excursion. Uh, of course, we, we need to look into to that and learn our lessons um, uh, out, uh, out of the current disaster. Um, but apart from uh, these direct um, reactions uh, and interventions, um, I have a few questions, more questions than answers maybe. Uh, number one, uh, or, or what does it mean for, for development policy in the longer term? And number one is not a question that is um, a conviction uh, on, on my side. We need to see that the Ukraine war uh, is an issue sui generis. 
uh, it, we, we must not accept that militarization of our foreign and uh, development policy gets a new normal. And I want to be very clear inside the government, I always ex expressed full support what we did with shifting our uh, German military policy. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm behind all the decisions taken uh, by, by NATO. But again, it's an it's a, it's a issue sui generis. It, uh, we, we must not accept that this gets uh, the new normal. Usually I don't think, say things twice, but I'm so convinced that this has to be clear. Uh, because I doubt that it is clear for everybody. Uh, and number two is the SDGs and uh, the Agenda 2030 um, remains the right concept. And um, I mean, in 2015, I was very much involved in, in the um, negotiation process of, for the Paris Agreement. And of course, it's, um, I mean, it's a very well understood political process, uh, the climate process, it's, it's charismatic and, and so on and so forth. But I always said, uh, if you look at the deliverables um, uh, at the year 2015, the agenda 2030 was a much more important one than, uh, the, than the Paris Agreement. Uh, I don't want to relativate uh, the, the Paris Agreement. It's wonderful and I, I was lucky to be part of uh, that. But if we were in future in a position where we have fixed the climate problem, but still don't deliver on all the other SDGs. The world community will st would still have failed totally. So we need to look at these processes in parallel. And um, I mean, already prior uh, to the pandemic, um, we were in many, uh, for, with regard to many targets, off track. Um, and uh, of course, the pandemic versus the situation. Uh, every every target where we were behind, uh, we got even further from reaching the target, and where we had made progress, it was slowing down. Uh, each and any targets, education, inequality, uh, you, you name it. Um, so, um, but, but we um, what, what we now need to do, and it's difficult to imagine how we can do it. This is part of my question. We have to speed up it, during the next seven years. We have to be more efficient, uh, we have to be better, and we have to be faster um, or eight years ahead uh, than we had been uh, during the last uh, seven years. And it is, sent, it is essential uh, to get out of the devil cycle from distress uh, to conflicts. Um, so we need to fight against hunger, poverty, inequality. Um, we have to uh, fight for were resilient health systems, much more than vaccines, uh, what we saw now uh, uh, and what we learned during uh, the pandemic. Uh, we have to fight for the right of education, um, something I learned, newly learned in the, in the ministry. Um, education cannot wait, how true. Uh, and of course, we have um, uh, to fight uh, against violating our planetary uh, boundaries. And thus, um, bringing the world on a 1.5 uh, degrees co uh, climate, uh, compatible climate tr uh, track. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that it is a, a very important uh, part of our G7 uh, presidency. And I, I just saw um, your press release and I'm happy that we get so much support also from the uh, T7 on that. Um, not less than uh, the climate we have to um, uh, look at our biodiversity, something I, I mean very close to my heart for my uh, um, whole lifetime. Uh, it's always a bit in the shadow um, of the big climate discussions, uh, but uh, not uh, less relevant. And I really hope that we finally uh, will have a COP uh, incoming uh, on this important issue as well. Uh, adding one uh, one uh, environmental issue to, to that, maybe more than environment, uh, is we need to protect uh, uh, or protect and uh, restore our soils, fertile soils. I'm just coming from the CCD COP uh, in um, Abidjan, uh, the most highly underestimated of the three, uh, three Rio Convention. Without fertile soil, um, you can forget out, um, about the whole SDG um, uh, target uh, set. Um, it's uh, relevant not only for nature, but also for agriculture, and thus fitting again to the food security um, issue. Um, so in a nutshell, again, we need to be um, better and faster. Uh, and at the same time, we are facing more challenges uh, and obstacles to get on track. 
and I will just mention two of them. The number one is the availability of resources, public resources, public funding. I mean, um, it's not that the ministers of finance around the world are bad guys. Huh? Uh, they are all under, under stress. Uh, we exhausted our public uh, budgets uh, and in, in a way we have to get it clean again. Uh, and um, that uh, means that uh, budget consolidation will be um, a key issue in many, many of the donor countries. And we see it here in the debates. Uh, we survived more or less this year. Um, who knows what next year will be? Looking uh, into other parts of the world, also to our heroes, the Nordics, um, you can get uh, some question marks. So, um, uh, and I'm not accusing anyone, uh, but it's a problem. Uh, um, and um, I mean, we, we need to get more intelligence than trying, trying to push our ministers for finance. We will do that uh, more than they like. Uh, but again, there will be a gap, a substantial gap, maybe an increasing uh, one. So what can we do? We, we need to do more with less. Um, and I worked a little bit on, on the issue of uh, um, uh, finance um, in the context of the 100 billion um, um, that was, were pledged in Copenhagen for developing countries for climate uh, finance. We, together with my, my colleague and friend Jonathan Wilkinson from, from Canada, we came up with this 100 billion delivery plan. Uh, and I just want to share one uh, observation. I mean, uh, yes, we were 20 billion um, behind um, um, in some areas for good reasons, by the way, because uh, renewables uh, as a, a key uh, climate technology um, doesn't need uh, any public or in many regions of the world any public support any longer. So it doesn't account um, uh, to, the, to the public budget um, uh, part, um, but also for some very bad reasons. Uh, and for uh, one is that the leverage factor was much lower than we expected, all of us expected. Uh, and how come? Uh, how, how can we leverage more private investments? How we can assure that, that the green investment and that the social investment, that the SDG investment becomes the new normal and the, the brown uh, um, investment uh, gets out of the, the market. That is the way where, where it comes uh, back to the question, how do we look at development policy where, where Heidi Vichoy uh, so, um, um, ended um, uh, in her endeavor. We want to look, look at it as a global structural uh, policy. Otherwise, we will not uh, fix uh, the problem. And the second point I wanted to mention as an obstacle or a challenge, and uh, I saw it also in your press release, and I have some, some questions about it, also some doubts, uh, and that is multilateralism. Um, I, I mean, yes, um, I, I can sign it if needed with blood. We need uh, multilateralism, and we need more than we had. Uh, but there is high pressure. I mean, um, you mentioned in your paper the G20, and of course I, I support the G20, but we are, um, it's very likely that we will end in the G20 in the situation we were in with the US administration, both in G20 and in, in G7. So it's, it's um, hard to, to imagine that we will have uh, family photos with heads of states and government and Putin sitting there. Um, in, in a way, Russia is out. For, for many, many years. I, I don't have the capability to imagine uh, that our leaders will, uh, in two years, sit together with him and we, we forget all what, what had happened. This will not be the reality. Uh, and uh, so for G20, it's a big challenge. Uh, we, we have to find solutions, maybe working a bit around uh, Russia. And of course, we will uh, support Indonesia and, um, and, and after that, uh, India to find the best ways, best diplomatic ways. But it's not something easy. Uh, we have to be clear about that. And the whole the UN system, uh, I mean, uh, the Security Council, we can forget about it. Uh, now, we, we knew all these vetoes in, in the past already. Uh, but now it's it's getting really uh, dramatic, uh, and all the other uh, UN institutions. So there is a big need uh, for the UN um, to rethink itself, uh, maybe uh, uh, to create new formats, new ways uh, how to solve this issue. What well, the conferences where I'd been, whenever a Russian politician high enough was uh, starting to speak, all the rest left. 
but this this cannot be the way how we um, uh, can proceed in the future. On the other hand, uh, although I worked a lot with Russia, um, I, I cannot do it uh, working with them on global challenging as if there were was uh, no war. So um, uh, maybe to to um, end positive. Um, uh, there are um, um, there are some ways to overcome this uh, this situation or these challenges, and one of them uh, are the uh, polylateral alliances. Um, and um, maybe one of the newest and freshest and most brilliant one was the Jet P with uh, South Africa, the so Just Energy Transition Partnership. Uh, and I, I did invest uh, quite some months uh, to, to get it run together, uh, together with friends. Uh, and I was never in my life so proud that we made it in quite a couple of months or weeks uh, to, to launch it in, in Glasgow uh, on equal footing with our South Africa. Uh, and uh, that is something uh, we, we want to duplicate with, with India, with Indonesia, Vietnam, Senegal. There's no one size fits all. All of them are different. All of them have different mentalities. So we, we have to bit, get also the right sense how to approach them. But I think that is um, an appropriate uh, way forward. And it is needed. Uh, I saw, and the Chancellor will be ha very happy that you are supporting um, um, climate clubs, inclusive ones, of course. But we will only get inclusive climate uh, clubs if we uh, proceed with this jet piece. Because uh, accepting in a climate club uh, standards uh, and level of decarbonization will only be acceptable for some of our partners, basically all the G20 being not G7, uh, if we provide uh, sufficient tools and instruments and financing to help them in transforming their economies. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much for thank you very much, uh, Jochen Flassbart, for giving us this tour de force. I would say, um, with all the ups and downs that that unfortunately exist, um, I also thank you for ending positively. Um, and we would now take one round of questions and comments, but just one round. So please come in. And I would first of all like to hand over to Dennis Noah, Global Solutions Initiative. Thank you so much for your very interesting and important um, comments um, that you've made on the geopolitical situation, State Secretary Flassbart. One thing in particular, I believe, deserves greater highlight, which is you spoke from the heart when you said the geopolitical situation has changed and Russia has created new facts on the ground, and therefore it is very difficult, if not impossible, to work with Russia on other issues. And the question is a matter of principle. Do we allow the war in Ukraine to infect our climate negotiations, our negotiations over biodiversity, and many other global areas. Where should the war have an effect, and where should we continue negotiating um, despite the war, just because there are global problems? That would be the question that I'd like to pose you. Thank you, Dennis. I see Mr. von Haldenwang and Mr. Klingebier. And last round. And Ms. Thank you also from my side. Thank you, uh, State Secretary Flassbart, for this uh, great presentation. Um, you asked about or you, you encouraged us to, to come up with uh, ideas about how to proceed. And, and one advice, one suggestion that I would have is the G7 should get out of fossil fuel subsidies. They pledged to do so some four or five years ago. They said until 2025, we will get out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. They have to live up to that promise. 
And I would say they can get out of coal subsidies even before that. They should go out of coal subsidies in 2023. It's possible. And it's fossil fuel subsidies have all the elements that we don't want to see. They create lose, lose, lose situations because they encourage emissions, they are inefficient, and they are um, also quite often regressive with regard to their distributive impact. So this is something where we would really like to see action. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, Mr. Klingebeer. Stefan Klingeby, German Development Institute. Thank you so much for sharing your views um, about the situation. I have two questions um, for, for you. The first one is um, dealing with all these multiple crisis situations, pandemic, Ukraine, migration, you name it. Uh, what I'm trying to look for, and I don't have an answer, I must say, what is our proactive approach? What is our strategic approach? We are just responding to those crisis situations. Is there something like a strategy how to deal with the next crisis my second question to you is all these crisis situations pandemic migration security we uh, climate change of course requires um, uh, a very close interface between policy fields ministry of foreign affairs uh, environment etc is there any new element in what you are doing in how you are doing it to bring those different actors closer together. I mean, Germany is not unique, so each and every government has this kind of challenge, but maybe you have some new ideas, new approaches, how you are managing those interfaces. Thank you. Stormy Miltner, Aspen Institute. Thank you so very much. Uh, these were really insightful uh, comments and I enjoyed them tremendously. Um, I also have two quick questions. The first one is, um, we get better explaining the thank you so much um, <laughs> going up and down and up and down um, the Zeitenwende internally um, and I was wondering because I just come back came back from India if we are also explaining the Zeitenwende sufficiently to our partners and what we are going through um, the second question um, concerns um, the instruments which are already out there to tackle the triple crisis um, of food, energy, um, and, uh, and finance. We heard Rebecca Greenspan this morning, and she said very clearly, the instruments are there. It is just a question also of political will for the G7 to show flexibility, to open up funds at the IMF and the World Bank. And I would be interested in knowing if there is the sufficient political will of the G7 to be flexible and to be fast. Thank you. And one more, I apologize, from our Indonesian friends and partners, Jose Rizal. Thank you, Anna Kantarina. It would be very short questions. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Secretary Plasmas, you mentioned about G20. Uh, and then in, if the worst scenario that G20 uh, this year fails uh, to happen, uh, the summit failed to uh, take place, then what do you see the alternative of a G20 uh, uh, agenda? And what about the futures of G20? Uh, uh, or is there any other alternative that we can find to get uh, together uh, for, the, uh, for the global uh, governance uh, and global agenda? Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. So, um, well, very difficult question. Uh, in a way, no, of course, uh, we cannot accept that the war destroys all the progress on, on the, in the other areas. But what, what I, uh, in a way, um, with a lot of question marks uh, put into the room is, I cannot imagine how we can, um, uh, can get the, the right track on in these formats uh, having this situation. Uh, it also, of course, depends a lot on, on Russia itself. Um, uh, if there is a minimum of dignity, they might decide uh, to, to come not on the high political level to some of the key conferences. That would be really something good for the world, because then we are not um, trapped in this difficult political uh, situation. 
uh, and also whether they are going to support uh, key decisions in Sham el Sheikh, in Kuming, or would they block something? Um, as, as everybody knows, uh, we, we need unanimity. Uh, and of course, they can use it to, to well, create pressure and all this. So it's not only dependent on the rest of the world, it's also a lot dependent uh, uh, on, on Russia. And I agree, uh, it's impossible to, uh, to stick into this situation, but uh, I just wanted to share uh, what I'm thinking about at, at the moment. And it's one, the multilateralism, the crisis of the multilateralism is one of the, the well, key challenges that we are facing. Um, yeah, the other one, G7 out of fossil uh, fuel. Uh, <laughs> the interesting point was that it was always said uh, um, out of, uh, in the declarations, out of inefficient uh, fossil fuel subsidies, what, what was read very differently by, by different actors. Uh, so uh, some said, uh, of course, uh, an, a subsidy is efficient uh, if it addresses exactly what it is meant to, uh, to be. And as I said, as, as you and I, uh, or, fossil subsidy is inefficient uh, in itself and we have to get uh, rid of it um, uh, well a lot of opportunities now um, I, I was afraid that we would even get deeper um, back into the fossil uh, world uh, and uh, but uh, of course it's also um, it has also the potential that more people understand that uh, the, the aggressive promotion of renewables is a way forward. Otherwise, we will find ourselves a, a new dependence, uh, dependency. So, yes, I agree. Um, um, then, um, well, the strategy how to deal with, uh, with the next crisis or how to be uh, prepared, uh, not, not, not a full strategy, of course. In, in all dignity, uh, I don't have it, but uh, um, looking, uh, I mean, these, uh, crises are all interdependent, uh, not only the ones you mentioned. Uh, whatever you, you touch, you f will find links to, to, to all the other issues. And uh, so the right approach is to look at them as such and not to try to, to solve them in silos, uh, but trying uh, to f find holistic uh, approaches and again, structural political uh, approaches. Uh, we had, uh, at least in Germany and some other countries, wonderful 10 years uh, where we, we could increase our budgets for developing um, development uh, cooperation year by year. Uh, and I said it, this will be over. Uh, and it, in a way, intellectually, I, um, I think it made us also a bit lazy. Um, because of, still, although we had uh, quite a lot of money, um, did we solve the problems appropriately? I have some doubts. Uh, so the answer is not a real answer, but uh, looking at it structurally uh, and uh, holistically. Um, the interface um, b between different policy areas is needed, of course. Uh, sometimes it's difficult in governments. Uh, uh, we, we started in this new government. I, I seriously can say it um, uh, very good. Uh, and I've seen the end of the last uh, uh, government where we, we didn't find the right approaches uh, to interact uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 a, in a better way. Uh, and um, looking at the climate uh, file, for example, um, we, we have now the Foreign Office, uh, the Ministry for Economic uh, and, and Climate, the Environment Ministry and us. Uh, and what we did together with my, my three colleagues, we created what we call uh, uh, the Clean Climate, uh, Team Climate Germany. Uh, so we are meeting um, um, regularly uh, on the state secretary's level, just uh, uh, of course in other countries this doesn't happen, but uh, sometimes in, uh, in, in our government you have also um, some discussions about competences and all these things. So we, we want to have fast solving of these needless, um, um, well, uh, insufficient discussions. And uh, I, I think we are on, on, on a good uh, track. Hopefully we'll, we will remain. Um, then, uh, ah, do we explain a Zeitenwende um, sufficiently to our partners? No. Uh, and. Um, um, I would say because it's it's a it's a name, it's an idea, it's it's um, 
well, it, it has some first contours, uh, how it might look like. And of course, it started uh, uh, from uh, the military changes in military policy. And uh, it, uh, luckily, the chancellor immediately said, but uh, this cannot be the only answer. So we have to make more out of it. Uh, and uh, so I think I would say uh, we are at the beginning of a discussion and maybe the best way uh, to inform our um, or uh, to outreach to our partners is also to ask them to, to, to make them part of the process. Uh, what uh, what a positive uh, Zeitenwende might look like. Um, 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 um. Maybe. What, which are the, are there red lines, are there areas where you would foresee cooperation with Russia despite the war? I think that was the, the first question. Yeah, that was or the first question. Or is it too question. early? Too early. Yeah, I, I would say it's mm. too early. And, and, and maybe again in uh, German, you, um, in the past uh, weeks uh, and months, it was very easy to be accused as a Russian understander. I was one of them. Uh, uh, and um, I always, not in a, in the sense of understanding, but in the sense of talking and bridge building wherever you can. And uh, I did it constantly over the last year in the field of um, climate cooperation, uh, environment, biodiversity, waste management. Uh, and I thought I'd do it for the good. Uh, and I still believe that it was right to do so. But of course, we are all shocked. I, 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 you, you, you personally, as a human being, you think, what have I done wrong? Didn't I see it in which direction uh, this guy is going? So I, I wouldn't say red lines forever, but a very, very hard time um, to, to get out of that. Uh, and the last one was the G20. Very, very, um, very happy to, that you asked this question, which gives me the chance. Of course, I, I always would have said, uh, and I still say it, um, the G20 uh, is uh, the more future-oriented uh, form than the G7. We, we, if you want to solve the uh, global problems, we have to look at the 80 percent uh, of the problems, and this is basically the G20, including uh, the G, uh, G7. And I, I think we have some experiences how to well get around it, uh, even if you have uh, one partner missing. We all know that these 19 plus one or six plus one decisions uh, we know how to handle it uh, i know um, indonesia is, is a very has a very skilled diplomacy uh, there are many friends and partners around uh, to help so i think the rest is not uh, in an interest to to be destructive on the contrary and hopefully we are um, the sooner the better in other times, and then the G20 is, is a very relevant, forward-looking and promising format. Thank you, State Secretary Flassbad. I really would like to thank you for this open, this substantial, um, this insightful exchange. Uh, we are tomorrow um, submitting the communique to our Chancellor and have a bilateral exchange, and nevertheless would like to also submit it to you um, now here in, in presence and jointly with my colleague. Vielen Dank für, für Ihre Zeit. Vielen Dank. Okay. And of course, the thanks go to, goes to all of you who contributed to this important document, hopefully important document. And thank you for, for joining us here today. Yeah. <laughs>
shape the future of the world for many years to come. And two issues, both of which have been mentioned um, by Sarah yesterday, I think strike me as take homes that we should take seriously. The world, the first issue is the world is facing multiple crises. There is the war in the Ukraine. In addition, there is a climate crisis, there's a food crisis, there is a debt crisis, there is a stalled recovery, high inflation, uh, huge problems um, arising from the stagflation. There are a variety of problems waiting for us, um, biodiversity loss, antimicrobial resistance, um, one could go on. But these are all issues that deserve urgent attention now. And the only way that we can tackle these issues is through multilateral approaches. Therefore, any talk about multilateralism has failed and we should return to national boundaries is simply nonsense. It does not address the issue. And the other interesting thing is when multilateralism has reached its limits, we should appro approach plurilateral alliances as a second best option and do that proactively. So that's issue number one. And issue number two, I'll be very brief, is that we should be aware that we are entering a new world order. World order that has been initiated through the Russian aggression in the Ukraine that changes the geopolitical context. And what that means for our future is not something that is simply given and out there. It is something that we determine right now. And in particular, our leaders will determine. And that decision as to what the new world order will be will depend very much on the value-driven narratives that we tell. And we've discussed here that the narrative of the West versus the rest, the North versus the South, the East um, versus the West, these are all narratives that do not lead us to multilateral problem solving for multilateral problems. And what was suggested um, by uh, Minister Schmidt right at the beginning is that perhaps we should look at a split between rule of law versus might makes right. There, that really seems to be sort of the utmost limit uh, on what we must agree on in order for multilateralism to proceed. Now, if that is to be taken seriously, that has lots of implications for the future. And uh, that is one of my takeaways, uh, the, well, the second issue that I'd like you to take away from this conference. And I'd like to hand over to Anna Katarina. Thank you, Dennis. Um, we yesterday started off by sort of unfolding in front of ourselves the multiplicity and yeah, multiplicity of crises, and also the how simultaneous they unfold, how they, what kind of dynamics they unfold between them, and that they call for a joint address, yeah, a joint address, which was also just now underlined again. It's not the climate crisis is, is a crucial one, but there are so many others, the food crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the geopolitical crisis, the, the crisis of the multilateral system, and they have to be addressed jointly. So it remains to be a priority setting exercise and at the same time an exercise where we need to strengthen our governance systems to overcome fragmentation. You asked just before after the fragmentation between ministries, how can we 
facilitate inter-cross-ministerial um, exchange? How can um, the same happen across scale levels, of course? How can we address um, the substantial challenges on the UN level? Um, I think in many ways our discussions revolved throughout the past two days around questions of exactly that. How do we strengthen, how do we invest into our governance systems in ways that they are being developed further to address these multiple crises in a systemic ma manner? We have, of course, the, the club governance formats that can play a role here, but that also are struggling with their challenges. We've discussed this. So I think it's important to um, also remind ourselves of the fact that we, while we focused on state-based state governance systems, that's of course not the only uh, governance we are all involved in. We are also all involved in our everyday practices through civil society organizations, through the private sector involvement in, um, in non-state form of governance. And I think the, the challenge in the, in, in the coming years will actually lie in also linking, linking these, linking informal forms of governance with the state-based forms of governance that we have and that are struggling. And that means that we need to, of course, invest, and it was said already, invest into education, invest into literacies, whether it's health literacy or climate literacy or food literacy at the moment, yeah, but, um, and, and uh, digital literacies, including information politics and politics of truth, one could say, yeah, politics of what is, actually, what is actually true, what is actually worth knowing, um, in order to, to um, move ourselves beyond the current situation. Now, I don't want to talk for too long. I think um, just to, to remind us of the fact continuity was emphasized again and again, continuity within the T7 and T20 processes, um, just as much as, of course, on the political level. Um, and looking inside, looking at ourselves, I just want to remind ourselves that the Think7 process, as we exercised it now in the, in the past months, was st still quite new. Uh, we were, um, it was, if I understand correctly, the first time that an official Think7 engagement group was announced so we are in the process we used the months to find ourselves and we now um, urge also the japanese um, presidency to take it further and to also initiate another think uh, seven process in order to then for us to reflect probably more systematically than we did this time on how to understand this think seven process as part of the think 20 process and, and not just as a, as a parallelity that we can then not fully fulfill all of it. Yeah? So how do we unpack this? I think that's another task for us to take away with. For now, it has been two long days. Um, we come to an end. I would like to once again thank all of you, all of us. I would like to all of us ask, ask all of us again to look at the communique and the different policy briefs and not only look at them, but especially send them to your policymakers. Yeah, we are within the German context, we are advertising them to, to um, the different uh, levels, the different ministries. But please also do the same, contact the policymakers, decision makers in your own countries in order to um, encourage here also the trans-regional dialogue on these levels. Let me um, end by saying, Thank you to especially those who made all of this possible. Yeah, I would like to especially thank the Friedrich Ebert Foundation who ho hosted us in the past, the past few days. I want to thank the Aspen Institute, so Miltner, for cooperating with us. The German Council on Foreign Relations, Ms. Schmucker, thanks. and the Global Solutions Initiative and the DIE, <laughs> and here especially the two teams that actually made it possible um, around Axel Berger and Sarah Johns and Ms. Staufer. Thank you.
Thank you and travel well wherever you go. Thanks. See you again soon.